Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning into the Sheila Zelensky Show. Make sure that you are following me on social media. Up on your screen, you can see it there, but for those listening to the podcast, you can find me on Instagram, Sheila Zelensky, all one word on Instagram. On Twitter, it's at Real Sheila Z. Facebook, Real Sheila Z. If you are not already one of my patrons on Patreon, please do support me over there. And for those of you that have the means, please do become a premium partner. This show is 100% listener supported. It's ad free listening, no sponsors, no advertisements. There's also other ways to support this ministry, including you can send check or money order to box 396 Woodland Hills, California 91365. And you've asked for some ways to donate that are simpler, like Cash App, Venmo, Zelle, and there's PayPal and GoFundMe options. All that information is there, SheilaZolinsky.com slash donate. And we've made a lot of convenient ways for you to donate, so check those out. Well, this guest today was very overdue, and I'm very excited to have him on the program today. He is a good friend of the program. It is the one and only Dr. Danny Marie. Morano, powerful apostolic preacher doing amazing things in India. And I want to talk about that towards the end of the program. But without further ado, I want to welcome our good friend, Dr. Danny Morano from GodIsNotReligious.net. Danny, welcome to the program. It's great to have you on. You were long overdue. So glad to have you back on the show, my friend. Oh, well, thank you so much. You know, thank you for that wonderful introduction and uh, blessed new year to you and to your listeners as well. And I'm just happy to be back on with you. This one was a little battle for us, but we got it this time. So I'm excited about what we're going to deal with tonight. Danny, we're living in unprecedented times, rumors of wars, a lot of obsessing with the affairs of this world, the media pumping out a steady diet of scary stuff like, well, we're entering World War Three. That's that's looming, all this stuff going on with Iran. Look over here. Look at this impeachment. Look at this distraction. Listen, we're not to conform to the pattern of this world, yet I'm getting the emails. Everyone's worried and distracted with all this stuff. The flesh is always reacting. Yes, of course. I mean, war is fearful. I mean, you know, let's not pretend that that's not a scary notion. Uh, of course, war is a very fearful prospect. And I was actually talking to a young lady today, and she gave me a kind of interesting perspective from the younger generation. And, you know, we're dealing with weapons today and, and the abilities today to blow the world up that we never had when we were very young children, you know? I mean, uh, it's a very scary notion. I mean, just someone touches the wrong button, and we could have, you know, consequences for generations, if not, you know, uh, more. I was also talking with someone today about the fact that uh, you can't enlighten a dead man spiritually. Spiritually dead people are going to be dead to spiritual truths. They're not going to discern those things, as the Apostle Paul said. The natural man does not even perceive the things uh, that are spiritual or that come from the Spirit of God. For their foolishness to him, neither can he uh, understand them, for they are spiritually discerned. So, you know, of course, the world, if they're in the flesh, if they're walking in the power of their minds, their intellect, and the fuel of their passion, the fury of their emotions alone— uh, they also live a life of reaction, Sheila. One thing that uh, the Lord taught me years ago is that if we're truly walking by faith in the spirit, as we say, we're not living a life of reacting to, to things. Watch this, people. Follow me on this. We don't react to life through fear. We act on life through faith. And that's the difference of being in the spirit or being in the flesh. And I'm sorry to say there are many Christians, okay, people who either are culturally uh, identifying themselves as Christians according to certain beliefs, or they truly are born-again Christians, but they have not learned uh, how to walk in the Spirit. In other words, to allow the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to truly govern their thinking mechanism, govern, uh, you know, the stable ruling of their emotions and so on. They're still fueled by the passions of the flesh. So they react in fear, and they follow the world script in fear, and instead of 
acting on life through faith. That's what Jesus did. That's why Jesus of Nazareth was so different. He did not come to the world and react to what was going on in the world. Uh, because if you react, people, to everything that's going on in the world, you'll drive yourself insane. I mean, the, anywhere you can find a news bite that's going to scare the hell out of you. Anywhere in the world you can find a news bite that's going to grieve you to the core. Anywhere in the world you can find a news bite that's going to disgust you and revile you according to wickedness and twistedness and perversion. Uh, so that's, that's like a never-ending abyss. There's no bottom to that. You know, so if we're if we're being ruled by that, if we're reacting to what we hear, to what we see, even to what we feel, Sheila, OK, uh, in our natural man, then we're never going to be at peace. We're never going to be at rest, so to speak. We're never going to be able to walk in the, what we call the joy of the Lord because the flesh is on fire. The flesh is always reacting. You know, you mentioned the media, Sheila. And uh, regardless of which form of media, it really doesn't matter, radio, TV, internet, 99.9% uh, .9 of it is driven by negativity and by fear because that's what sells. People like to be scared. That's why people like to go to horror movies. Uh, people enjoy negativity because the flesh is wired by the prince of the power of the air, the prince of this world, Jesus called him. In other words, Satan and his fallen angels and the demon spirits have hardwired this world uh, to tune into their channel. And, of course, they're pumping out negativity. They're pumping out fear. They're pumping out doubt and unbelief because they're warring against the kingdom of God. And they want people to stay in their realm thinking their way. Ephesians 2.2, 2, very powerful scripture. I've been teaching on it a lot lately. That people that are in the flesh, whether they call themselves Christians or not, whether they are Christians or not, Sheila, but they choose to continue to walk by their natural intellect. They continue to walk by the fire of their emotions, and they don't bring these things into subjection, like the scripture says, taking every thought captive and bringing it under the obedience of the word of God and of Jesus Christ. And they're just allowing themselves, even though they profess Christ and they believe in him, and they believe that the word of God is true, they're still being ruled in their emotions and in their thinking according to the way the world thinks and what the world speaks, and the anticipation of the world events according to worldly calculations, according to worldly measurements. This is carnal. What does carnal mean? It means of the flesh, of the natural man, not uh, inspired by the Spirit of God. And the majority of people on this earth are walking that way, whether they call themselves Christians or not. Many Christian leaders, I'm sorry to say, Many Christian leaders that are there are supposed to be the example in teaching other Christian believers not to react to life through fear, but to act on life through faith, are also reacting to the world. They're also allowing themselves to stay in the matrix and, and be part of the hard wire of, of the world, uh, the prince of the power of the air, right? The prince of the power of the air, the scripture says in Ephesians 2, keeps men walking according to the course of of this world. Another translation, the spirit of this age. The prince of the power of the air is the spirit which works in the children of disobedience. Okay? So there are people that have accepted Christ, okay? Many even have uh, received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues and prophesy and all this other great stuff, lay their hands on people to be healed, even sometimes cast out demons. But when it comes to renewing their mind in the way they deal with the things that are happening around them in the world, they're still immature, they're still carnal, they're still allowing themselves to react to the world script instead of acting through their faith on the kingdom of God's script. And that all has to do with the same thing that I'm talking about, which is that Christians today do not have the revelation of what the kingdom of God really is and what Jesus has called us to in becoming part of his kingdom. Uh, you know, it's very key, and I've mentioned it on this show before, the interview that Jesus had with Pilate. 
when the Jewish priests turned him over to Pilate, the Roman governor, to do their dirty work, to put Christ to death because he was a threat to their ruling religious slash political order. When Jesus stood in front of Pilate, Pilate said, are you a king? You are accused of, of calling yourself a king. Therefore, these men have brought you to me as a subversive because you are claiming to be a king. And he said, so are you a king? And Jesus answered very interestingly, you have said, right, I am a king. Now listen to what he says next. But my kingdom is not of this world. For if my kingdom were of this world, I would be calling my servants to fight for me. But my kingdom is not of this world. But you will see the Son of Man coming in all the glory uh, and the holy angels in that day. So this is what, what Christians don't have a revelation of today. And I say 99% of most Christian leaders, especially in the West and particularly in the United States of Mystery Babylon, do not have the revelation that when Jesus calls us, he calls us out of the world system, not to be part of the kingdoms of this world anymore. When Satan stood with Jesus and he tempted him and he said, if you'll bow to me, I'll make you ruler over all these kingdoms. They're in my power. Jesus rejected that offer. And there were no kingdoms or nations that were accepted. Jesus didn't say, oh, yes, you can you can offer me all these other kingdoms, but you can't offer me the USA and the new state of Israel because they're God's nations. Jesus didn't say anything close to that. OK, Jesus recognized that all nations were under principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness until that day that he breaks the sky and he comes to rule for his thousand year millennial reign and then into eternity. Christians must get the revelation. They're saying that they worship this Jesus of Nazareth who is a king who has a kingdom that is not of this world. They claim that that's who they worship. And they claim that they belong to that kingdom. Yet, they fight for and they send their children to fight for and be killed and to kill other people in the names of kingdoms that the Bible tells us are satanic kingdoms. At this time, in this hour, finally, that Jesus has not called us to a mixture Mixing in the nations of this world, the politics of this world, the religion of this world, the philosophies of this world uh, that, that come from the hard wiring of fallen angels and demon spirits. And they must see themselves as citizens of the new Jerusalem, which is in heaven. Okay, I listen to Christians talk right now with this Iran thing going on. All right, and they say, oh, we're sending troops. Oh, we're going to war. Our president says they're trying to impeach our president. We need to go to, uh, to war against them. And Okay, hold on a second. What kingdom do you belong to? I've been preaching on a scripture that's a very short scripture, but it says so much. It says this, he who would be a soldier of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's military terminology, right? He would, who would be a soldier of Jesus Christ, watch this, does not involve himself or allow himself to get entangled in the civilian affairs of life. Yet all I see in so many Christians, churches, Christian ministries, especially Christian leaders, is they're all entangled in the civilian affairs. In other words, the affairs of the world system. And they speak with vocabulary and with terminology and with pronouns, we, us, I, our, that connect them to the kingdoms of the world as if they belong to those kingdoms, okay? In this sense, the United States of America. I'm in America as a Christian. I was born here. I have an American passport. I have an American birth certificate, social security number. So I am an American. So when the United States of America declares war on another nation or sends troops to, uh, you know, do battle with uh, other nations, I'm part of that, you see, because I'm an American. Well, 
I hate to tell you folks, this is going completely against the call of Christ. Christ has called us out of this world system. Our identification, our citizenship, we're told clearly in so many places in Scripture. Hebrews 11, Galatians 1, 6, so many different places in Scripture, as well as Jesus himself telling us that he has called us out of this world system, out of the kingdoms of this world, exclusively to be citizens, soldiers, servants, children, sons and daughters of him in his kingdom. And he said his kingdom is not of this world. Therefore, he told Pilate, I do not have my servants fighting for me in this world. Why, Sheila? Because there's nothing to be gained. Because as Peter said, and in, in, you know, the letter of prescribed to Peter says, God already sees this world and its systems like a dirty old rag. And he has already passed his judgment on the earth, already passes judgment on the kingdoms of this world, and therefore Christ and his people have nothing to gain by trying to, ready for this, save the world, save the planet, bring reform to the world system. We have no investment in that, for our kingdom is not of this world. Now, people will come right at me and say, but aren't we supposed to be salt and light to the world? Aren't we supposed to be a city set upon a hill? Yes, exactly. A city set upon a hill outside of the kingdoms of this world, shining the light of Christ into the kingdoms of this world, calling men out of the kingdoms of this world into the kingdom of our God and his Christ. What does it say both in Daniel and Revelation? The proclamation is made. The kingdoms of this world have now become the kingdoms of God and his Messiah and the saints. So we have no inheritance in these kingdoms here. Does that mean we don't pray for people that we're not concerned about what unregenerate uh, wicked men are doing because they like to worship Satan and they need to have human sacrifices, so they start wars to kill people. Uh, they want to steal people's money. They want to steal people's natural resources, oil, gas, diamonds, poppy fields in Afghanistan, whatever it might be that they're trying to steal under the guise of patriotism and defending. Uh, I'm not defending my nation if I'm leaving my nation to go fight. That's an offensive move. That's not a defensive move. You see the game? And Christians, because they're walking out this mixture, and this is the Christian religion, Sheila. This is the Christian religion. This is not the life of Christ, the kingdom of Christ, this is the Christian religion, okay? What our friend over there in the Vatican calls the empire of Christ on earth, and he claims to be the vicar, the representative, the mediator of that kingdom on earth for Christ, okay? They're trying to build Christ's kingdom on earth without Christ being here. Well, the scriptures condemn that. The scriptures say when Christ returns, then he will build his kingdom on this earth after he vanquishes the kingdoms that are on this earth. But until then, those kingdoms are still under the sway, the influence, the power of principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. And they are influencing these prophetic fulfillments. Just because God through the scriptures, has prophesied these things are going to occur, doesn't necessarily mean that he's the author of these things. Some of the things he is, but many of the things he is not. The machinations of wicked men trying to kill each other and steal from each other and rule over their fellow man, God is not inspiring that. The God of this world is inspiring that. And uh, just a note, where did war begin? Do people ever think about that? Have they ever studied that out? Where did war begin? 
Actually, war did not begin on the earth. War began in heaven. Revelation 12, and there was war in heaven. And the dragon fought against Michael the archangel. And Jesus said, I saw Satanael. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And in Isaiah 14, that he threw, in other scriptures that are not in our canon, that he threw the devil and his angels out of heaven because they... They came with a revolution, a weaponized revolution, believe it or not, against the throne of God, against the Godhead and the holy angels. And they lost that battle and they were thrown into the atmosphere of the earth. And now they wage war on God's creation, what's been created in God's image, man. And they cause man to war on themselves. This is all the work of high evil spirits. So we have no part of this. Jesus had no part of this when he was on the earth. Sheila, the zealots approached Jesus, did they not? The zealots were there. They were trying to carry on the tradition of the Maccabees and, and the great Old Testament warriors and so on, King David and this and that. And they approached Jesus to join or lead their uh, revolution against the mighty iron-fisted kingdom of Rome. Jesus refused when the disciples said, when his message was rejected by the people and the disciples said, do like Elijah, Lord, call down fire from heaven and consume these people. Listen to what Jesus' reaction was. You know not what spirit you are of, for the Son of Man has not come to kill men or take men's lives, but to give his life as a ransom for men's lives. You see this? So Jesus is not in this, Christians. And you may not like me. You haven't for years because I take this stand. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Stop the nonsense. I prophesied to you in 2016. The Lord brought a message, and I prophesied to you that Trump would be become this president. You would get the president that you wanted, Christians. And God warned you through the prophetic word in the book of Samuel, just like the Israelites wanted a king like other nations, that God would allow this because that's what you want to follow. You want a king you can see. You want a king you can put your pride in, that you can see, that you can say, oh, that's Cyrus. That's the Christian president of the Christian nation of the United States of America. But the Lord said to uh, Samuel to tell the people, you know the story, perhaps when the people came to the prophet Samuel and they said, we want a king like other nations. And Samuel was grieved as God's prophet. And Samuel went to God and said, God, what is wrong with your people? How can they be like this? I told them you are their king, but they don't want that. They want a fleshly king, a human king, like other nations that they can see, that they can hear, that they can follow in, you know, in, in the way that other nations do. God said, that's fine. Give them what they want, Samuel. Give them what they want, but give them this warning. He's going to tax the hell out of them. He's going to recruit their young men and send them off to war to be killed. He's going to use their women and children, think about World War II, to work the fields. So just be ready because this is what happens under human kings. And again, this is not about him and this is not a condemnation about a particular individual. This is the way of man, Sheila. There is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So Christians want to follow man, okay, who, who is right and righteous in his own eyes, wise in his own eyes, as he follow, walks in the ways of death. But on the other side of their mouth, okay, schizophrenically, spiritual schizophrenics, on the other side of their brain and their mouth, they want to claim that they belong to this exclusively spiritual and heavenly kingdom whose ruler is Jesus Christ who, who sits in the heavens. Well, this is Christianity. This is the religion of Christianity. This is Christendom, which means the empire of Christ on earth, okay, according to man. But it is truly anti-Christ because Christ has not called us to these things. Christ has called us to recruit soldiers for his 
army, as citizens of his kingdom. But as you said when you started off this program, we are in a spiritual war for men's souls. But it grieves me that Christians, are, again, because they're in the flesh and they haven't renewed their mind and they're not walking in the spirit and they're not as you said, thinking on heavenly things, they're thinking on earthly things. That's what it means to be carnal, is to think on earthly things. They're not concerned so much with the souls of men. They're concerned with the flesh of men. They don't want their way of life, as George W. Bush used to preach, ripped away from them by an enemy in the flesh. But the question again is, is their way of life the way of Christ. And that's what I want you to kind of help people understand that are listening going, okay, but what does this look like? Help people understand what this looks like too. There's a phrase, come out of her, my people, but I don't think people understand that. Well, what it looks like is it's a relationship that's in the spirit world with the spiritual Lord. And we recognize that our enemies are also spiritual enemies. Doesn't the scripture say for the weapons of our warfare are not earthly or carnal or of the flesh sensual, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The world's fights are not our fights. And that's hard for people who are still all caught up in the world and are still living for this world, for this age, for this life that Jesus said. What did he say? He who loses his life for my sake will gain it. But he who tries to hold on to this temporary earthly fleshly life, he will lose his eternal life. But he who lets go of that, in other words, you know, the world says, John, John Bon Jovi sings it. It's my life, it's now or never. I just want to live while I'm alive. And then he quotes Frank Sinatra and all these other sinners that are, you know, more than likely down in hell right now paying for the life that they live here. All right. And as we talked about when we first started recording this the last time, those who practice a satanic Christianity, what do I mean by such a radical term? A satanic Christianity. Satanism is not worshiping Satan. Satanism is worshiping self. Let me say it again. Satanism is not worshiping Satan. Satanism is is worshiping self. Why do I say that? That's right. Because the chief commandment in the Satanic Bible, as written by Anton LaVey and taken from Aleister Crowley and from the whole tradition of Satanism and the occult throughout the age, is based on this commandment, do what thou wilt, for this is the whole of the law. Do what you want, for this is the whole of the law. Okay, in other words, the God of this world wants us to be happy. The God of this world wants us to be fulfilled. The God of this world wants us to be successful in this world, in this life, in this age. The God of this world offers us, just like he offered Christ when he stood before him and tempted him, the glory of and the splendor, and the riches, and the wealth, and the fame, and the fortune, and the prosperity, and the blah, 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 blah of this world, if we bow down to the God of this world. What's most important to him is that we are happy. This is being proclaimed in this abomination called the church, posing as the body of Christ today, as the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the God of heaven, that the Lord Jesus Christ wants us above all things to get what we want, to have what we want, to enjoy what we want, to have the most of this world while we're here. Well, the scripture is very clear to anyone who reads it with common sense. Anyone who reads the scripture, and the new, even if you just read the New Testament, you can even reject the Old Testament. Just read the New Testament. Just read the words of Jesus himself, and you will see that that is the opposite of the call of Christ. Call, Christ said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross, his instrument of torture and death, take up his cross 
and follow me. If any man come after me, let him hate the things that are most valued in this world. Let him hate his mother, his father, his brother, his sister, his friends, his own renown, his own popularity, his own success in this world, his own self. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. When the rich young ruler came to Christ and gave him his resume and said, look, look, I'm an upstanding member of my community. Look how good I am. I'm in church all the time. I tithe. I pray. Uh, I've gone through all the programs. I support my community, my local church, synagogue, whatever. From my youth, I have done these things, he said. Jesus said, oh, wow, impressive. That's really terrific. You know what? You're only lacking one thing now. Give that all up. Renounce all that, all that that you are trying to impress me with, that you are showing me how righteous and religious and good of a person you are, and that you show to other people who you are. Give all that up. Count that as cow dung, as Paul put in another letter in the New Testament. Count that as garbage. Give it up and come and follow me. It's another kingdom. It's another way of life. And that way of life, and Christians don't want to hear this today because they love the world, but we are called to make our investment in this short, James calls it a breath, a puff of smoke, a vapor. That's what our life on earth is in comparison to eternity. So this puff of smoke, this vapor, this is supposed to be spent investing in into the eternal life that is going to come. So what does that mean? That means that I'm gonna fight for the things that have to do with that eternal kingdom. I'm gonna spend my time, energy, gifting, resource, finance, all that I have, I'm gonna spend for the coming kingdom, for the souls of men, for the proclamation of Christ, and for the coming kingdom. I'm not going to, as a soldier of Christ, get all entangled in the civilian affairs of this life. In other words, fight the world's battles. Yet, many times, the biggest push to fight the world's battles is coming from people who claim to be conservative, Republican, right-wing, flag-waving, gun-toting, Bible-thumping Christian. This doesn't match. Christ has called us to lay down our lives for the coming kingdom. And I just exhort people to go into the Bible, in the New Testament especially, and look and see where Paul or Peter or John or James or any of the apostles got involved in the affairs of Rome's battles with other nations, where they got involved in trying to get the right emperor to sit on the throne, where they got involved in any of the civilian affairs, even of Jerusalem and the state of Israel. Once they were filled in the Holy Spirit and they received the commission from Christ uh, to go forth and proclaim and give witness to the coming kingdom of Christ, they were totally consumed with that, Sheila. They were not distracted by the things of this world. But let's look at so many who call themselves Christians, so many who call themselves Christian leaders, so many who claim to be, you know, churches of Christ, ministries, they're so caught up in fixing this world. What are you fixing this world for? This world is already condemned. Let the heathen do what they will do with the little bit of time they have left. What does it say at the very end of the book? The angel proclaims, okay, the end is coming. He is coming soon. Amen and amen. Let the wicked go on being wicked and let the righteous go on being righteous for God will judge it all. Christians with their dominionism and so on and so forth, they want to legislate the kingdom of Christ on earth. Well, Christ is not in this because he himself did not give us the example of legislating his kingdom on earth. He told us that his kingdom is not of this world, but that when he returns, then he will legislate his kingdom on the earth. 
for example, God has really given you a passion for India. Yes. There's some dear brothers over there. And here's the interesting thing. I find this interesting that you mentioned this whole prosperity promulgation. I'm highly favored. I'm highly blessed. It's about your fate, your destiny. There's nothing about being in a spiritual battle, taking up your cross. I don't know about anybody else, but I'll tell you what, my life has never been a picnic since I was saved. These mega ministries at these boatloads of resources and stuff. Hey, listen, Kenneth Copeland, he brags about being a billionaire. Listen, the devil finances his projects. And I really believe that Satan goes to great length to block up and stop up real ministries that are preaching deliverance, salvation and healing. That is the kingdom right there. Lots of people have lots of resources. They're all, oh, my investments, my 401ks, how much money they got in the bank and how much in savings. And yet we're struggling ministries that are really trying to reach the lost. And this is what I want to tie into India because you've got a trip coming up in February. Yes. I don't want to come off as sounding like one of these prosperity pimps because you know what? Shame on anybody that actually can say with a straight face that that's what either one of our ministries is about. People know what we're about. We are talking about, Danny, some incredible things going on in India. So I want you to talk about that right now. Thank you so much, Sheila. I really appreciate you and such a passion sharing that burden with me and that vision to reach these people. There are many, many people still that need to be reached in you. U.S. and Canada and the West. But I'm going to tell you something. The East is busting wide open. My phone is blowing up. Everyone, you, you saw some of these ads for these upcoming meetings and the Bible schools that I've started, Sheila. Every time I put these ads up, my phone is blowing up from so many other ministries and precious men and women of God over there that are serving on the field with practically nothing. Please, brother, please come to us, too. Please come to us, too. We're, we need this ministry, too. We need to learn, too. We need these crusades to be done, too, and so on and so forth. And they're willing to work. You wouldn't believe, Sheila, the soldiers that Christ has on the field over there. When I land in just a couple of weeks in into Visakhapatnam, India, this is a city of millions, one city full of millions of people. Most of those people have never really heard a proper presentation of the true Christian faith and the true Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Uh, when I land there, I got hundreds of pastors on the ground that are working with me. I got hundreds of young men that are being trained up by some of those pastors. We're going on television there for pennies, Sheila, for pennies. You know how much it costs to go on Christian television in the United States? I know you're very familiar with that. Over there, I can go on, on Christian television, reach millions of people two times a week, for about $50 a, a week. I mean, this is unbelievable. And what has happened is we've taped my meetings that I've had there and my other trips, and we'll be doing the same when I'm there. Whether I preached at crusades, healing crusades, or whether I preached in churches, or whether the pastor's conferences, uh, they're going to be airing these things on television in India. People are going to be seeing healings deliverances, miracles. They're going to be hearing the anointed word of God in their own language. We're doing the Bible schools there on the ground. Uh, we're doing it over the internet. I, I meet with them once a week and I have Bible school with them over the internet. I've had a group of a hundred or more pastors that meet every month in that particular city that come to sit under the apostolic word. And now they're ready to go go to work when I land on the ground. They're all excited to go to work with me in these healing crusades. Sheila, these healing crusades are going to start at 10,000 people and up. Okay. And it's not about, you know, everyone gets down on numbers. Okay. But, you know, when you're dealing with multi millions, I don't think reaching 10 to 50,000 people is really a magnanimous number. Okay. It's still a very small number in comparison to the people that need to be reached. Uh, nevertheless, I'm very excited about this. We're going to have three to four nights of healing crusades and preaching the gospel, the Holy Spirit going forth in mighty demonstration, deliverance
deliverance, healing, salvation going forth. And there will be 10,000 people and more in attendance on these nights. Uh, we're also going to have pastors conference with hundreds of pastors coming to be trained on, on who the body of Christ really is, Sheila. You know that this is a big part of my message. Uh, I don't teach the church. I've taught who, you know, what the church really is. I teach the ecclesia. I teach the true body of Christ. I teach according to scripture, the gathering together of the called out ones. And these shepherds are coming to learn what it means to be a real shepherd pastor, not to focus on buildings, institutions, and all these other false doctrines, unfortunately, that have come alongside those things for 1,700 or more years. But God is bringing the revelation of what Jesus initially said was, was he would build his people, his ecclesia, his gathering together of the called out ones to Jesus Christ. We are the temple. We are the house of God. We are the body of Christ that he has left on this earth. So what's exciting about that, Sheila, is that in these lands, we're starting from scratch with that fresh, pure message. And these pastors are accepting this, especially the younger people are coming in and learning that from the beginning, what the truth is about who Christ is. Also, when I go there, I don't preach the religion of Christianity versus the religion of Islam versus the religion of Hinduism versus the religion of Buddha. No, I preach clearly. Jesus did not come to start a new religion called Christianity, and he's the God of that religion, just like Allah is the God of, of Islam and Buddha is the God of Buddhism and so on and so forth. No, 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 no. I'm not preaching the religion of Christianity. Jesus didn't come to do that. Jesus didn't come to start an institution called the circus, the kieka, the daughter of the sun god Baal, the church. Jesus didn't come to start that. Jesus came to create a new race from fallen men. When fallen men are transformed, they're born again, as we say, and they pass from eternal death to eternal life. So I'm so excited, Sheila, because we're going there and the Lord will provide. And I thank you for your precious people. And I want to reach out to them right now and say, I love you so much. And I thank you so much for the past couple of years where you have heard the cry of Christ's heart through me to help me to go to these places. And it's your fruit as well, folks. It's not just Danny Morano's fruit, Sheila Zelensky's fruit, and others that are working with me directly, but it's your fruit, folks. Those of you that have prayed for me, those of you that have given financially toward these missions, you are part of that fruit. You will be rewarded when you stand before Christ. You will be rewarded for your part, for your taking part in these missions. And people will come up to you, in, whether it's in paradise or whether it's in the millennial kingdom. People that you've never seen with brown faces. Yes, I'm talking to Americans and Europeans and Canadians and Australians, maybe, that are considered white people. Many brown faces will come up to you. You have no idea who these people are. And they'll say, because, because you helped uh, that brother and that ministry come to our land and preach. I came to the Lord Jesus Christ. I was saved. I was delivered. I was healed. I was born again. And here I am in the kingdom of God because you heard, you heard the plea of the Holy Spirit to finance this mission, to pray for this mission, to get involved in this mission. So I just want to appeal to you folks. This is just, Sheila, it's the tip of the iceberg. I'm telling you that I'm trying to figure a way to get all these places that are asking me to come this year to be able to get to them in 2020. This is my goal. They want me in Haiti. They've been begging me to come for Haiti. I got a group of 50 pastors that have committed themselves to me. They keep banging on my door saying, when are you coming? I thought you were coming in January. When are you coming? I have precious brothers up in Nepal and Bihar, which are the northern regions above India that are so persecuted. Uh, Christianity is so persecuted there. Please, brother, will you come? Will you preach here? Will you do the Bible school here? Pakistan is exploding, Sheila. My last trip was to Pakistan, and, about, and I'm about to go back to Pakistan again as well. Um, is exploding over there. I got a bunch of young men. I'm talking about men in their 20s, Sheila. 
men in their 20s, all they're doing is going out preaching Christ, laying their hands on the sick, casting out devils. And they're in Bible school with me. They come on once a week and I'm discipling them. Fresh, new converts that are hungry, so hungry and thirsty for Christ. I don't have to debate with them about silly doctrinal issues. I don't talk to them about Indian politics. I don't talk to them, absolutely don't talk to them about American politics. They don't want to hear that. They want to know about Christ. They want to learn Christ. They want to serve Christ. They, they're willing to die for Christ. And the, the mileage that we get from the little bit of seed that we were able to sow, Sheila, and that we're able to water with the uh, tiny budget that we have to work with and they have to work with over there, the fruit that comes because these people are so hungry and they fall in love with Jesus Christ and they want to serve him with all their hearts. They're not fighting for anything or anyone else than Jesus of Nazareth and the coming kingdom of Christ. And this is where I'm so excited about investing my life because I'm seeing the fruit. I wish I could say that in the West. I wish I could. I hope someday I can. I still preach here. I'm doing it right now. Um, but it pales in comparison, pales miserably in comparison with the reception of the word of God and the anointing and all of that in the East. They're so hungry and demographic. Sheila. Let's get practical here. You said earlier in the program, okay, practically, how do we look at this? All right, let's get practical. The median age in Canada, America, Western Europe, Australia, so on, 55 years old. That's the median age, the average age. The median age in Iran, folks, okay, you're so concerned about Iran in the flesh. Why don't you get concerned about Iran in the spirit? The median age in Iran, in India, in Pakistan, and places like this, 25 years old. What does that mean practically? Well, what that means practically is that when these people are reached by Christ, they're just starting to set the course for their lives. They're just beginning to make their lives decisions, their lives vocations. OK, they're not 55 years old looking toward a luxurious or comfortable retirement to settle down. They're looking at what am I going to give my life to and for? So you're catching them at that age and you want to talk about revival. Wow. What a potential for revival in places like this. Millions upon millions upon millions of people. India alone, 2 billion people. Pakistan, a billion or more. I, I, I don't know the exact number. But we're talking about billions of people, Sheila. Most of them not having been reached. Okay? The demographics are something like 0.001% whatever of anything claiming to be Christian. So we're not even talking about Holy Spirit filled, walking according to the true word of God, fired up Christians. We're talking just about people that subscribe to some form of the religion of Christianity. So we're talking about when Jesus said, do not say three months from now, but I tell you that the harvest field is already white and ready to be harvested for you are entering into other men's labor. So this is what we're doing. And I cry out to you folks. I appeal to you. Please go to my website, godisnotreligious.net. Please go to my Facebook page, God is Not Religious. Go to my YouTube, God is Not Religious. Look at these precious people in these nations of, in particular, India and Pakistan. Look how much they love Jesus. Look what they're doing with the little bit that they're being given. And they're begging for a preacher to come. The Apostle Paul said, how can they hear unless there's a preacher? How can a preacher go and preach unless he is sent? So I'm asking you to send me, folks. I appeal to you in the name of Jesus to help to send his ambassador, help to send his apostle to these lands so that they can be trained up and they can continue this on until Jesus, until Jesus returns. I need your help. Right now, I need about $15,000 to do both of these campaigns in February in order to go to India to do the meetings there 
and to do the meetings in Pakistan. Many Christians give five times that in a week, if not more, to a lot of people that are on there claiming they need to have their own plane so they can fly from one side of this country to the other to preach their fake prosperity gospel. They live a gospel of money, they preach a gospel of money, and they need you to support them so they can go and preach and live that gospel of money. And and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, are given every week, every Sunday of the week, millions upon millions upon millions of dollars are given for people to sit and seek the Lord, to sit and hear the word of the Lord again, to sit and hear about souls, sit and hear about the law, sit and, okay, but Jesus called us to go, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, that's what we're trying to do here, and I desperately need your help, and I'm asking you to hear the Lord's voice, and no, you don't, I'm sorry to break it to you, you don't need to have a dream, you don't need to have a vision, an angel with a flaming sword doesn't need to show up in your bedroom at three in the morning, Jesus told us what to do, he gave us this command, you may not be able to physically go, but you can go in, in the spirit, you can go with your wallet, You can finance this mission. You can pray and intercede for this mission. And we need this, people. We need this. So I just appeal to you. I ask you to join in on this mission, and we're going to be having many others this year. I'm just excited about this year, Sheila. 2020 is going to be an incredible breakthrough year. Uh, I believe in several countries where Satan has such a stronghold. We're going to see thousands of souls come into the kingdom. We're going to see the true body of Christ enlarged and built up. And we're going to see true Christian leaders trained, equipped, parted to, anointed, and sent forth into the mission field. So I just ask you folks, join with me in this. Okay, Danny, just go over one more time exactly what needs to come in, the total amount that you need, uh, sort of by the end of the month, pretty much. Okay, we need to raise at least $15,000 in India with all these crusades and pastors' conferences, and uh, we're going to do two weeks in Pakistan. And I may, if I have enough, I'll do two weeks in India as well, because they're asking me to come to several other places that I'm only going to be able to accomplish if the Lord provides the funds. So we're really trying to raise about you know, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars is what we need to be able to pull that off. And I know it's a short period of time, but I know that there are some folks out there. Just one of you could sit down and write that check, and the Lord will bless you for that. No, I don't believe in prosperity pimping. I don't believe in the fake one hundred fold return message. I don't believe in any of that. But I do believe that Jesus said, "Give and you shall receive." Okay, full measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over men shall pour into your bosom. And I lived that out in my life, and God is good to me. He does give back to me because I give to him and to his work and to his people. So you will be blessed for uh, helping Jesus reach these precious souls that he's crying out for. Godisnotreligious.net slash donations on my Godisnotreligious.net website, Facebook, YouTube, everything is God is Not Religious. I'm going to donate to this India trip and I'm challenging everyone, get your checkbook out and write the biggest number you can. You cannot outgive God. How much are you willing to invest in the kingdom? Ask yourself that. I want to see Danny's PayPal button lighting up like the 4th of July. I'm serious, folks. This is very important. And again, the information's linked up there. Danny, thank you for your time. And thank you for your ministry and what you're doing in other parts of the world where the gospel is being preached. Thank you very much for that. Oh, let me let me also say thank you so much, Sheila. Thank you so much for your heart and your love and your commitment. And thank your precious people. I love you folks so much. And I appreciate you. And everything that we share on here is not brought in a spirit of condemnation or judgment or to beat you up or beat you down. We love you. We don't want you to waste all the lovely gifting and passion and fire that Jesus has given you through the Holy Spirit on things that are not going to bear fruit in your life and give you eternal reward and give you fulfillment and satisfaction and contentment in this life. You want to pour those things, you know, where it matters. I want to let you know also that we're also doing the online Bible school, the Ecclesia 
online Bible school for folks in the West as well, from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m., I'm going to be running the online Bible school. And you can um, be part of that. Please contact me. Let me give you an email to send me. You will also come on and get the same kind of training that I've been talking about here on Sunday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll have an hour of uh, going over our lesson and the teaching. I'm teaching from my book, The Sinner's Prayer Gospel. I'm sorry starting off with that and then we'll be getting into other texts as well and of course with the with the word of god accompanying that getting into the bible and with the first hour we get into our lesson and second hour is question and answer comment and and fellowship so i want to invite you to do that so write me at god is not religious one at gmail.com god is not religious one at gmail.com. So I just welcome you. Come and be a part of this. Receive this apostolic doctrine, this impartation. What a shame that I'd be giving that out on the other side of the world and so few people would be receiving that here in our part of the world. Please do get behind this, folks. Danny, thank you so much for coming on the program today. Thank you too, Sheila. And bless you and your ministry and all you're doing. Folks, that was Dr. Danny Morano, godisnotreligious.net. The information is up on your screen. And I just want to remind people that I am working on finishing. So I'm hoping it will release Monday, Tuesday. And that's that part four of that mind control series. This show has been such a challenge, but I'm really hoping it'll be up the early part of next week. And thanks for being patient. A lot of you have emailed me about it. Thank you so much, folks. Please get behind this incredibly important mission that Danny is on. Please get behind him. And I appreciate that. We'll see you real soon. Good night and God bless you.